welcome to the best panel of the day. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, DEI and boy, has that been in the news quite a bit. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, have our panel introduce themselves, starting with someone who I've known for a while now, uh, Dr. Tamika Hobbs. Dr. Hobbs. Uh, good morning, Dr. Uh, Ms. Cass Jackson. Good to be with you. Uh, good to be with everyone who is here in our virtual audience. My name is Dr. Tamika Hobbs. Uh, I am absolutely thrilled to, to be here on this to talk about this very important topic. I am a historian by training with a focus on lynching and racial violence. For the past seven years, I've also had the privilege of working with the South Florida People of Color in anti-racist education group uh, that has performed uh, diversity education and inclusion uh, training both at the community and at the professional level. Most recently, I have been appointed to the position of library regional manager for Broward County Libraries, African American Research Library and Cultural Center. Thank and you. Good, I'm sorry. Good morning uh, to all. Uh, my name is Sidney Calloway. I am the um, uh, lawyer here at the uh, local statewide law firm called Schutz and Bowen. Uh, I specialize in government practice, governmental affairs, as well as uh, complex litigation, which includes civil rights uh, and a host of other uh, workplace uh, type of uh, uh, disputes that are uh, uh, here in the state of Florida. Uh, I also serve uh, on various uh, boards and uh, either public and private. Uh, I have a, a sincere passion for organizational uh, structures and governance, and I've dedicated a lot of time in the community around uh, the needs of uh, not-for-profit uh, uh, companies, including uh, the Urban League of Broward County uh, in terms of satisfying their missions uh, but also doing so in a way that uh, advances the, uh, the needs for uh, the community and the host of things that uh, are required for an organization to, uh, to perform at the highest level. Good morning, everyone. Very happy to be here with you today. My name is LaKendria Robinson. I am the founder and CEO of the Arenda Collective here in the Tampa Bay area. We uh, partner with mid and large size organizations, nonprofits, for-profit companies to create and implement very strategic diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives um, to help them reach uh, and engage more intentionally with their internal and external stakeholders. Um, I um, have been doing this work for quite some time and I'm currently very focused on serving on boards and aligning um, our organization to do a lot of anti-discrimination work, as well as being able to position uh, local businesses, minority women, veteran and LGBTQ owned businesses uh, to gain access to opportunities that help them grow and scale their company. Thank you for that. So I am live from Tallahassee and uh, uh, we are, have had much discussion about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And my question, the first question is, what do you think about this movement away from diversity, equity, and inclusion, or is it a movement away? And if you could describe it in each of your uh, individual spaces, Dr. Hobbs, you're in education. What are your thoughts? Oh, thank you, Yolanda. It's um, been really painful to watch this. Uh, I think both professionally and personally, when you understand the canon of, of history, of United States history, and specifically the challenges we have had in making sure that there were accurate stories told about Black folks and our experiences here, and what an uphill battle that has been uh, in over my lifetime, and especially the last few years over my professional career, has been absolutely thrilling to see uh, scholars studying the Black experience, uh, scholars of color in particular, and the amount of success and acclaim that they have been able to achieve, and more and more importantly, the way that those correctives uh, and just be clear for everyone when we talk about impacts, and I hope we'll come back to this 
is that when you see these things happening in the academy with scholars and the books that they publish, that has a trickle down effect to the K-12 system. And you begin to see that narrative change. We have had here legislation over the past 20 years to mandate the teaching of black history, specifically African history and all facets of it. That has been a real spark of progress. But we're in a moment now where we're watching all of that change be, being wiped away. Uh, we are seeing the traditional pathways by which we acknowledge and vet scholarship and the creation of new knowledge. Uh, there are mechanisms uh, among professionals in the various academic fields within our institutions of higher learning that have been operational for, for decades. All of that is being sidestep now by a legislative process that is coming in without having the appropriate expertise and crowning themselves with the ability to be able to determine what should be taught, what is valid as knowledge, uh, and more importantly, uh, getting down to the professional careers of, uh, of our academicians, many of my, my former colleagues, determining their fates within the academy. Uh, uh, so from that vantage point, it is uh, deeply concerning. We've seen that trickle down also to K-12 uh, and the particular challenges that are facing educators in terms of what materials they have on their shelves, what discussions they can have in their classrooms. There, writ large, has been an extreme chilling effect uh, that I fear is going to be detrimental for the fate of our democracy long term. And so uh, while they may seem to be very isolated in some ways, particularly when we talk about uh, higher education, uh, to talk about K-12, we'll talk more about the business environment, we all should appreciate what this means for the health of our democracy. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Hobbs. And, and Sydney, so you're going to, I imagine that we'll have an increase maybe in cases, civil rights cases regarding this um, movement away from DI, are you seeing, seeing any trends or anticipate any? Uh, yes, uh, and, and obviously, you know, from uh, my perspective, I kind of liken what we're seeing now. Uh, if we look back at our history, there was a time where um, overt racism, uh, we can go all the way back, you know, through the 1940s and the 1960s, and we saw and we experienced the horrors of just blatant um, uh, kinds of conduct that antithetical to humane treatment of anyone, uh, but it has happened, uh, and uh, our justice system, uh, both our civil and our criminal, but particularly here, our civil justice system, um, what I admire so much about the uh, uh, black folks and the communities that are supportive of the ideals of democracy, the ideals of what humane treatment and equality and diversity is, uh, they have always been a core part of um, the litigation that has occurred in this country's history that has really advanced us too. And so today, um, we obviously have uh, an intersection between uh, demographics and the effect that they're having on our democracy, the impact of that on our democracy, and the response. Uh, so the response is, uh, well, we've got this Stop Woke Act. Uh, the response is there are other things that are happening legislatively and politically and uh, from a litigation standpoint that, that impact our civil justice system. And so here I'm actually gratified by, it used to be that we could say, we know what we're dealing with now. Uh, and, and, and that understanding and that awareness coupled with our ability to access the justice system, um, I think again, uh, we're gonna see um, the real where the road is gonna meet the rubber between right and wrong, that's gonna be in, in, in our court system. And so a lot of what constitutes democracy, it's gonna depend largely on how well our court system can respond to these challenges. Uh, and we've got a pretty obvious challenge with uh, this particular matter that uh, hopefully we'll talk about today, but our court system and the lawyers and the people that are 
uh, on the front lines, uh, I think are uh, poised uh, and are inspired uh, and, and, and competent to, to, to move forward on, on these issues. So I'm, apti, I'm actually optimistic that we are uh, in a place where we can confront uh, and challenge our democracy to be better. So thank you for that. And you mentioned uh, legislation. Uh, Ms. Robinson, this is for you. Uh, there is a bill uh, that has been floating around that people have been talking about, uh, House Bill 999, Senate Bill, the Companion Senate Bill 266, it's on special order. I want to read you some language and then I'd like to get your response uh, to it. Uh, in that bill, uh, 266, it's, it's specifically to a Florida college system. I'm sorry, I have to take my glasses off to see, but uh, <laughs> a Florida college system, institution, state university, uh, or, or state university direct support organization may not expend any state mm -hmm. or federal funds to promote support or maintain any programs or campus activities that violate one section or advocate for diversity, equity, inclusion, or promote or engage in political or social activism as defined by the rules of the State Board of Education and regulations of the Board of Governors. Yes, very, 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 very um, familiar with that. And what we are seeing, that language, um, unfortunately, and I know this from firsthand experience, has really stopped and put a halt on a lot of higher educational uh, institutions' ability to move forward with a lot of the programming that they've been doing for years. A lot of our higher education institutions, they already have offices of multicultural affairs. They have uh, chief diversity officers. They have um, these VPs of diversity, equity, inclusion that report either directly to the president or the provost or whomever. Um, and they have these really robust programs that not only support their internal staff, um, but they also support the students that are attending their universities from all over the place that have very different backgrounds, that have very different cultures. And it has been a real selling point for our higher education institutions to create programming that is very inclusive and welcoming and fosters this sense of belonging. Um, that also translates into how we get these students to complete their higher education and then move into the workforce, right? And so corporations are now um, structuring their internal culture around this sense of diversity and inclusion and belonging and those sorts of things. And so when we start to remove the ability for our higher education institutions to be that sort of center focal point of DEI, um, that then has a negative effect on the talent that we're able to attract in our state. Um, it also has a negative effect on the talent staying here um, long-term beyond, um, beyond college or grad school or what have you. And so uh, we are starting to see um, search committees dissolve for these sorts of positions. Um, we are starting to see a pulling of uh, line item budgeted um, funding for these activities as well, um, because we all know that if there's no funding, there's no programming. And when you um, are being requested to submit those budgetary line items that are specific to diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives and positions and those sorts of things, um, it creates a um, sense of panic and fear. I do believe though that it is sort of given our, our education institutions and organizations this quasi advantage to be able to really innovatively think about how they continue to do the work um, without being a target, if you will, of or, um, or uh, being subjected to having to deal with the consequences of this legislation. Oh, you're muted, sorry. I knew I was going to do that. <laughs> so, but I want to go back to Mr. Callaway. The lawyer and me can't help but talk about this whole idea of being targeted. Uh, should companies be concerned about uh, targeting if they 
somehow want to continue this mission of diversity, equity, and inclusion. How, Timmy, how do we do, how does a company deal with that? What would you tell a company that was in Florida about this targeting? Well, uh, the good news, it, it, it could, because we're, we're acknowledging that this targeting does exist, uh, and it does exist in some of the current legislation. And in fact, we've seen uh, the uh, amendment to the Florida statutes uh, under 760.10 relating to the Florida Civil Rights Act, which actually expanded uh, that Civil Rights Act to include uh, restraints on both public and private employers who would like to have diversity uh, and inclusion uh, programming, and it basically has some really overt prohibitions on that. So if we've got clients who are coming to us, we're going to let them know that that lawsuit, uh, that legislation, that statute is out there, um, and there has been a uh, defensive response to it. In other words, there are uh, plaintiffs who are uh, diversity and inclusion consultants. Uh, the plaintiffs also include uh, employers who are saying to the courts, we want to uh, express uh, our support for the need for diversity and inclusion. And in fact, we have been targeted. So there is a case, uh, Yolanda, that uh, is the uh, honeycomb, honeyfun.com uh, Inc. Uh, versus uh, uh, Governor DeSantis and the Florida uh, Civil Rights uh, uh, Commission. Uh, as well as the attorney general, all of whom, with the exception of uh, the governor per se, uh, has some authority to uh, not only target, but to uh, execute uh, some level of uh, enforcement uh, on these prohibitions. And so uh, we do have a, a preliminary injunct injunction that is uh, uh, in place uh, that has found that this particular amendment to chapter 160 uh, prohibiting uh, employers from endorsing and uh, concepts that relate to uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, this uh, injunction uh, actually found that that targeting, that structure is unconstitutional because it violates the First Amendment. It also uh, is uh, not in keeping with several other aspects of uh, not just Florida law, but United States constitutional law. So again, uh, the employers that we speak to, the uh, private businesses who are engaged in these activities, uh, they should know that uh, there is some uh, ability to protect themselves and to uh, have uh, some uh, uh, reaction to what uh, is uh, basically a government restraint on private activity that is unconstitutional. Uh, and so we do have the ability to, to assist with that, but also to uh, provide some overall guidance on where they should also look at. Wow, I hadn't paid attention to that aspect of it, but <laughs> I want to get back to this space of education because um, they started here uh, with this revision of diversity, equity, inclusion, and Dr. Hobbs, you alluded to um, banning the books. Uh, and, and some um, changes there in, in what curriculum can be um, taught. Uh, so where do you think this idea of banning books and focus on curriculum uh, leads to state in terms of higher education? Um, ooh, that's a, a, loaded, a loaded question. Um, and, and being in the library space now, uh, in a public library specifically, of course, you can imagine we're watching these debates uh, very closely. I've been encouraged here in Broward County that our commission has uh, voted uh, twice now, once in favor of supporting academic freedom, uh, and then secondly, uh, in support of the freedom to read, uh, really endorsing and enforcing that. So here, uh, especially as a publicly funded, intentionally Black institution as ARLIC is, the African American Research Library and Cultural Center, that gives us a great deal of, of comfort. Uh, in K-12, I want to segregate those discussions. K-12 is much more vulnerable and has been 
really in the center, front and center of so much of this, the uh, law now that it requires uh, and, and has real teeth to it. Uh, these teachers are operating under the threat of legal persecution if they have books in their classroom that have not been vetted. Um, and there, you know, the confusion comes is that there was no real process. Uh, there was a, a extreme backlog and having the media specialist as the law requires go through every book that a student has access to and coming to a determination that that book uh, in and of, of itself meets the, meets the requirement. Uh, the headlines that many of us have read have been what teachers have done in response to that, which is paper over their books, um, their bookshelves that they've expended a great deal of time and resources to make available to their students as an enhancement to their learning. I heard a very um, painful personal testimony from a teacher I met this weekend who talked about her lived experience in her classroom. Uh, her inability to make books that she purchased, hundreds of them available to her students, having to double check, triple check, and silence herself in terms of what she's what she's teaching. We haven't seen that come up in the same way in higher education, but in some ways, I think the impacts are much more detrimental. Uh, Sydney mentioned some of the lawsuits. There are law school, lawsuits that have been filed by university professors protesting mm -hmm. um, stop woke uh, that have had some success. There's been a recent injunction that was upheld at the appeals level that will allow that court case to go forward. It was engaged, as I understand it, by some DEI experts, as well as faculty members, a historian at the University of, of South Florida. So that is definitely a case to watch. But aside from that, when you have uh, a another round of this that is looking at tenure process, which is really solely about uh, having the sword of Damocles hanging over the heads of educational professionals. When you talk about 999 and what that will mean in terms of banning the funds that are there, um, I, I, and then that also, I have colleagues who are the heads of uh, African American studies departments, who are the heads of women's and gender studies departments. They will effectively, uh, that those 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 departments will cease to exist if that law goes into effect. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just want to echo, re-echo uh, what Lakendria said earlier, uh, and the impact that all of this is going to have. I know it can seem a little nebulous. But in terms of the business community, when you think about the workforce that is being developed here in the state of Florida and what you're seeing, not only in terms of content not being available to our students, whether they're in K-12 or, or uh, although in college, that those discussions, are they're not going to be able to have fully when you um, recognize what that means in terms of their cultural competency. You're going to, res the result will be that you'll have employees who don't have the level of cult cultural competency to make companies based in Florida competitive economically. And we don't have to talk mm -hmm. about the studies that are out there related to that. And so this is going to be some real impact for the business community because of the things that are echoing out of, of these decisions that are being made by the legislature. So I, I want to stay on that. Uh, C-E-N-T-S, whether or not it makes sense. Um, but Kendra, you're, I mean, you're on the advising side. Do you tell companies this is going to cost you money, you're going to lose business, or, or, or should the company just move to North Carolina? That's been thrown out. Um, how is, yeah, how does this affect the sense, C-E-N-T-S? You know, it, it is, obviously there is a business imperative for companies to locate or relocate in the state of Florida, right? Um, there are certain things that they look for and our workforce and our ability to be a free state, if you will, is very attractive. Um, and so when, when we are now talking about this legislation and, and looking at how the trickle down effect now affects their business and the promises that they have been made in terms of, hey, you'll have access to X, Y, and Z, you'll be able to um, create a culturally diverse organization with individuals from all across the world. Um, they begin to kind of rethink why they're here, right? Because 
you know, especially when you have a company that is trying to reestablish or establish a second or a third headquarters in the state of Florida, um, mm-hmm. and they are uprooting individuals from maybe the West Coast or the Midwest, and they're coming here, um, it, it is been a difficult conversation to have. And so what we are finding in in the conversation and strategy that we are looking into is how do we continue to do the work? How do we continue to make your organization internally more inclusive, a sort of um, space where all are welcomed? Um, And how do we create a space that is safe for your employees to exist? Um, And then how do we provide um, training and education for you when you go out and you are dealing outside of the organization, which is also very interesting because that's not something that the businesses signed up for when they relocated here, when they are locating here. Um, and so it, it really is this sort of mix of how do we create this puzzle, right? How do we take the puzzle pieces and fit them together when the puzzle seemingly does not work? Um, and so that is sort of some of the advice around language and strategy um, and creating a space for your employees to live and thrive outside of sort of what is happening um, with the state in and of itself. So I'm, I want to kind of flip it on this head because, I mean, we're here uh, supporting the Urban League. I know uh, Sydney has been uh, chair of Urban League. We put a lot of time, energy, efforts into the philanthropic organizations like the Urban League that promote equity and inclusion. What's our message now to companies to why they should still invest in community-based organizations like the Urban League, like the NAACP, if, uh, if diversity is now like button shoes, or is it? Mm-hmm. So I will take this and certainly would love to hear everyone else's perspective. One of the things that we have talked through with clients is if we internally cannot do the work because of this legislation, how do we continue the work um, in order to support those our internal and external stakeholders? And one of the key answers has been, how can we then partner with community-based organizations that um, do anti-discrimination work, that um, do this sort of higher level of DEI to then be able to provide that as a resource to our organization so that we can continue the work, but in sort of this almost indirect approach. Um, And so we are finding that our community-based organizations, a couple of whom I sit on the board, like they are now being re-energized to create curriculum that may fall outside of higher education, but more into this sort of corporate, this uh, sort of corporate client. Because to your point, we do anticipate that there will be an increase in these sort of civil rights cases and how do we Um, use our community-based organizations to support um, and sort of counteract what we anticipate will be coming down the pipeline. Yolanda, you're muted. I flunked mute class. Um, (laughs) I always do that. Uh, Any other thoughts on what companies uh, should be doing, organizations like Urban Leagues uh, should be doing to stay relevant in this space? Uh, Yolanda, I I do think that it's important uh, to stay the course, if you will. If I'm a company like the Urban League or some of the other uh, stakeholders in uh, the state of Florida and in Broward County in particular, I do think we need to stay the course on understanding that, um, you know, where we are now is not the end um, and, and, and the communities and the missions that we're uh, looking to achieve, uh, they're going to be intact um, to the extent that we continue to hold arms uh, on the matters uh, that are important to driving this. Uh, I, I don't think that this is a, a message that uh, we tell our, uh, uh, our stakeholders and our friends, hey, you know, don't leave the state of Florida. Um, 
I think, uh, again, we hold arms even stronger than we are now and work all of our various resources uh, within the community and, and including the legal community to address these issues. And again, uh, I am wonderfully confident that our civil justice systems and our community system is gonna allow us to pre prevail over some of these ideas. And uh, we're seeing uh, some of those benefits uh, now, particularly on, on uh, some of the things that are directly in front of us, like this amendment to chapter 760 and perhaps to the other uh, legislation that has um, impeded uh, what is happening in, in our educational system as well. I just want to chime in, if I could, and pick up with uh, what Cindy has, has, has stated. Um, I am very proud of the organizations that I've had the privilege to work with, to consult with, that are staying the course. Uh, they are demonstrating uh, a really important um, virtue, the virtue of, of bravery in the face of this. And, and I think that, as a historian, I, I think about years past. Uh, particularly when you talk about the experience of Black people on these shores, this is not the first time that we have had to resort to uh, different means um, to make sure that we got what we needed in terms of education. It was illegal for Black people to learn to read and write when we were enslaved, but we did it anyway. I take courage from folks like Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who, when he could not find appropriate information or appropriate outlet for the truth about the experience of, of African descended people, he created organizations, he created a press, he created a journal, and he created a public facing holiday that we now know as Black History Month to uplift all of those things. Um, I also invite all of us to think about what will be written about this moment 50 years later. Where will history find us? How will history judge us for the things that we have done uh, in this moment to meet this, this current crisis? I think that all of those are very important. And uh, just the last point, I wanna say that for an institution like ours, uh, the way that we are meeting this challenge is to really just amplify the things that we've been charged to do already to protect intellectual freedom, to protect the freedom to read, to preserve and interpret and share uh, Black history, and um, it, we have been fortunate in the example of the Executive Leadership Council. When they had their meeting here, they made a decision to vote with their dollars, uh, specifically uh, in the face of some of the challenges around African American history and studies in the state, and they made a significant contribution to, to our organization to help us to continue that work. So I think it takes creativity. I think it takes investment. I think it takes a level of uh, self-determination and do for self uh, in these moments. We have to remember that we're not beholden on all of these other dollars um, and all these other rules to, to do the things that we know are necessary uh, for our children and for the society that we want to have. Thank you for that. Uh, and you just stepped in another one. <laughs> history, history. So uh, one of the things that, that I kind of enjoy when I'm up here in Tallahassee uh, and when people come to visit is to remind people of the history of the legislature. Uh, remind people that we did not have a black member of Congress till 1992. We did not have a black member uh, since Reconstruction, and this mm -hmm. is a point that I'm making. Um, we did not have a black member of the state Senate um, since Reconstruction till 1982. We didn't have a black member in the legislature until the 70s, all within my lifetime. So I say that to say Reconstruction is instructive of the movement that we're going through. Yes. Um, and so I put that to the backdrop to the question that we have in the chat. And, and the question of, or was very, very pointed. It says, and I wanna read it in its entirety. It doesn't appear that letter writing presentations to school board and or rallies are being heard by the legislate, they say legislation, but legislators. What can citizens do to push back against these new laws when the governor is signing laws swiftly under cover of darkness? So who wants to take that first? Who wants to take that question first? Um, 
you brought up reconstruction um that is one of my favorite periods of history uh, when you think about what that moment meant uh, and those years meant in the aftermath of, of emancipation, the reality finally of liberation from slavery, from people who never thought that they would see it, the hope that they had for being able to be included and to experience uh, you know, uh, the democracy in its full right, the things that they did were, were phenomenal. And uh, I regret that more people don't know about it because I count it as a great source of inspiration. When you look at black elected officials uh, who were able to come into office after the passage of the 15th Amendment in, in 1870, you know, these are men, of course, because it was black men who were now brought into the body politic that they served at nearly every level of government here in the state of Florida. Our department, we, had a, we had a secretary of state who was a black man. Uh, our superintendent of education was a black man. It was black people, black voters, black leaders who established the public education system that we have here in the state of Florida because they knew that education was key to them remaining free. But you fast forward a little bit and you, you ask the question, why is it, as Yolanda pointed out, that we have this huge chasm um, of 70, 90, 100 years where there's no black representation, uh, not only here in Florida, but throughout the South. If you ask the question why deep enough, you get to some of the legislative policies that were put in place to disenfranchise voters, to marginalize uh, people of color, to prevent them from participating politically. That is how we ended up in, um, as Rayford Logan, uh, Howard historian, called the nadir uh, of American history, mm -hmm. where a period of so much promise was really squelched and stomped out. And what's, what's interesting to me as a student of history is the way that people have been able to resurrect that very same playbook um, for the very same ends. Um, but the answer goes back to the populace. I think uh, you escalate if, if, if you are not uh, achieving the desired effect, uh, you think about the, the resources that you have in your arsenal and our right to vote in this democracy has always been an incredibly powerful tool to shape the outcomes of legislation. Yeah, Yolanda, I would also add to, to that uh, relative to what can citizens do now um, to say that, uh, again, uh, what I believe we're seeing here, uh, again, is an evolution of democracy where it is not necessarily race-based. It is community, people driven around four sets of values that everyone can ascribe to. Uh, and so to the question, what can citizens do? Again, I say we look at what has been happening across the country uh, and we look to see how we can further uh, uh, pull ourselves together uh, with all of the members of the democratic community uh, that believes in the same, that has the same values, that has the same goals and, and, and objectives for what we think this country should be about. Uh, we need to do better with that. And, and again, I think uh, there, there's a tremendous positive uh, uh, interaction that we're seeing across the country uh, relating to young folks, relating to older folks, relating to people from all walks of life who are part of this country, who are deciding that they do agree on a set of values that are purposeful uh, and, and that are certainly necessary for what should drive this country forward in the future. And again, that is a reflection of what we're seeing by certain aspects of the challenges is because people do agree on a lot of things where uh, over time uh, that agreement wasn't so apparent uh, across our community, but we, we, we're able to see now that uh, the, the community is stepping up. And so I just encourage our citizens to, uh, continue to uh, make their voices heard, continue again to collaborate with each other. Um, and Yolanda, you probably know better than all of us, uh, the benefits uh, and, and, and the value of having a uh, community uh, together on uh, issues that, that, uh, that, that matter to legislators and that matters to uh, our, our, our government in general. So. Again, I, I think that's that's what I would uh, certainly uh, offer for, for for that question. Ms. Robinson. 
I am not going to uh, belabor that point. I think <laughs> Dr. Hobbs and Sydney did a fantastic job. Okay. Well, we, we're uh, coming to the, the end of this, as we are coming to the end of this legislative session. So we know that um, there are, you know, session will be over in two weeks. I want to talk about predictions. We'll talk about, uh, uh, we would say in the church, God and Christ prophesying. Where, where, where do you see this all going? Um, where do you see this going, say, within the next year, knowing that we have a, pres a, a governor that may be running for president, knowing that, I guess, last night, um, Joe Biden uh, said he is running uh, for president. Uh, we know that there uh, are many other uh, pieces of legislation that are going to affect our lives. We have permanent list carry. We've been talking about LGB2 trans um, um, uh, bills. We got so much. So in one sentence, in this last few minutes that we have on the panel, what is your prophecy for where this DEI space is going, say in the next year or so? Who wants to go first? I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, in one sentence, I think that we will see a reimagination of DEI, DEI and what that means and what that looks like practically, because right now, um, I think what we've seen probably over the last couple of decades is that DEI is a lot about training and cultural competency and unconscious bias training and those sorts of things. And I think what we will see because of um, where we are in this sort of legislative process, DI is sort of taking on this very actionable thing, this tangible, producing these tangible results. And DEI will have to move to a place that is now very action oriented, that is very results um, driven. Um, in order to counteract the legislation that could very well be passed in our very near future. Yeah. Um, Yolanda, a, a historian, and you're giving me one sentence? That's not fair. I'll just name that. <laughs> All right, so a I'll, sentence I'll... and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that the health of our democracy is completely dependent on intellectual freedom and the freedom of thought. My half sentence is that um, the power to shape our society, to shape our democracy, and now we're seeing to influence what types of curriculum are taught also are now in the hands of our, 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 our voters. And so uh, I just wanna offer those perspectives. Thank you for the extra half sentence. Okay. <laughs> Sydney? Uh, Yolanda, I'm going to uh, repeat or summarize what um, uh, one of the federal judges has said uh, relating to uh, this targeting of uh, um, employers, uh, particularly who are interested in DEI. Um, and, and that is the whole concept of um, you're asking people to uh, censor themselves. And if they don't do it themselves, then you're going to do it overtly. Um, the way to get at what you don't like about what people are saying is to say something better. It's a competition for ideas. Uh, and that is a, a fundamental core piece of our constitutional values that, again, I believe are civil justice system is just not going to bend to. Uh, there, it, it will stand strong on the idea that uh, the marketplace of ideas uh, is where the road meets the rubber. Uh, and you don't get there if you try to uh, uh, cut off the road from everyone being able to get there. So you can't mm -hmm. own that road. If you want to do it, you've got to show up. And, and again, that's where the competition begin. So I am optimistic 
uh, that uh, one, our just uh, civil justice system is going to uh, do the work uh, that is required of a, a strong democracy, but more importantly, that uh, the folks who uh, have these values, our community, our organization, our employer, they're also going to be part of that um, uh, process that, that, that makes it work. So I'm, I'm confident in, in our future. Well, thank you. Thank you to this great panel. Uh, and, and let me tell you something, being up here in Tallahassee is no picnic, but we have uh, 10 more days to go. And uh, we just thank you for your insights. And uh, I am going to turn it back over to our friends at the Urban League. Thank you for everyone for participating and attending.